BBC Two and iPlayer. A set of stairs is proving too much, but not for too much longer. DIY SOS, the big build in an hour. First on BBC One, time for some answers. Welcome to Question Time. On tonight's panel, Grant Shapps, the government's transport secretary and former chairman of the Conservative Party. Labour's shadow chancellor of the Exchequer, previously shadow treasury minister and an MEP, Annalise Dodds. Tony Danker, trained lawyer, businessman and former Labour advisor, recently appointed director general of the Confederation of British Industry, the CBI of course. General secretary of the UK's biggest higher education union, the University College Union, Joe Grady. And joining us down the line, co-founder and co-owner of several London restaurants, including the Wolseley and Zadell Brasserie, Jeremy King. Good evening. Welcome to my guest here in the studio, Jeremy. Welcome to you joining us down the line. And of course, welcome to our audience. Many familiar faces now joining us once again. And welcome to you watching us from home. Do join in the conversation the usual way on social media at BBC Question Time. Okay, let's get started with our first question, which is from James Alcock. Why can you sit on a bench on the 8th of March for a drink with a friend, but you have to wait 35 days later to do it outside a licensed COVID secure space outside a pub or restaurant? The social contact is no different. If anything, it's safer. So why are we waiting? So James, you're speaking from personal experience because you uh, run a one or is it two restaurants, I believe. What's, what's, yeah. what's your feeling about this then? Like I said in my question, I just think, you know, it, the social contact is no different. And as much as I believe the British public want to do the right thing, the reality is, is as, as a, an operator, I, I'll manage that for you. I'll make sure you're safe. That's what we do. We're experts in safety. If the guidelines are there to make sure people are one metre plus, one metre point five, two metres apart, I'll do that for you. I'll make sure it's safe. So I think to let people manage that themselves on a bench when they've not seen each other for so long is, is, is difficult. Ultimately, I just want parity in the rules and fairness. I don't mind if we actually wait until August. What I want is support, and I want to understand that there's some fairness, some parity. I think as an industry, you know, I've, I've had to wait one or two days after the Prime Minister for Rishi Sunak to come out, yet now I've got to wait a week till the budget. That's not fair. Um, I think ultimately we just want fairness, we want parity, we want to understand some clear message. And I think Boris Johnson's missed the chance to do something radical here and, and open the industry earlier, do it with that support, that, that safety and that thing that we'll do, we'll manage that outside for him. And I think he's missed a trick. He's missed a trick, Grant. Uh, no, I, look, I, everybody wants to get hospitality uh, open. Uh, it, we're desperate. Everyone wants to get out. Everyone wants to be done with this thing, of course. But... We know that uh, if you're not careful about the way you unlock, you end up right back where you started, despite having this you know, phenomenal rollout of the vaccine with, uh, I think, 18.7 million people having had their first vaccines by today. We still have to be very, very cautious with it in order that we can make this the final time. And, you know, I would love for us to be able to say, right, that's it, caution to the wind, off we go. Job done. Well, well the, James the is saying it's is, not though, fair. It doesn't strike him as fair. Well, well on, the, on, the, on the fairness point, because there's a big difference between something you can already do, which is go to exercise with one other person. Now we're saying you'll be able to go and meet with them socially, again, maintaining distance and what have you. But it's one other person. It's not a crowd of people. It's not a whole bunch of people. And so we've had to consult the scientists, ask for the chief medical officer's best advice and the, and the rest of it, ask the, the experts from SAGE and a group called SPY-M who modelled all of this, so it's not like it was all just kind of in, invented from nowhere. And they showed us that at each stage, if we do these things, this is what we would expect to happen to the response from the virus. And I just think, you know, the British people have been through so much. It's been such a long year. We do not want to blow it now. And, uh, you know, it, on the 12th of April, at the earliest, and hopefully it will be then, uh, we will be able to get that outdoor hospitality going, uh, including in, in pubs and venues. Jeremy. Yeah, I think um, the question was asked absolutely appropriately because we have no clarity. And I think the frustration in, in the hospitality industry is that we don't know where, where we stand. And I, just to, as we were talking about sitting on a park bench outside a pub, why is it I can order a coffee in a beauty salon on the on the 12th of April, and, and yet I can't order 
one in a restaurant on the 17th of May. We've, we've proven, the government has admitted, that we're safer than almost any environment. The amount of diligence and care that the hospitality business has put in to providing for its, both its customers and its staff is, is without doubt. So I feel that we're treated like children and, the, and we feel that we've got no understanding of what it is going to take for us to be fully open. And the arbitrary nature of this uh, five-week gaps, and we're told it's about data, not dates, but this five-week gaps, where suddenly we're going to go from very stringent conditions on the 17th of May through to all gloves off on 21st of June. I don't understand. The country doesn't understand. It's illogical. It's irrational. Well, just on the five weeks, uh, Sage called, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Grant, but Sage called for the five week gaps. Yeah, absolutely. And we actually had a professor of public health uh, on last week saying that it was difficult to be precise as to whether uh, restaurants, hospitality are, uh, are quite as, as safe in terms of rising infections as it might appear. It was very difficult to be absolutely categorical about that, despite all the efforts that everyone is, is making. Um, Tony, as head of the CBI, do you agree with Jeremy and with James that it's going too slowly for the hospitality business, which has suffered so much already? Well, it's clearly going too slowly, uh, James and Jeremy, for the hospitality sector, for the aviation sector, Grant will know well, and the events sector. There are sectors of the economy who are unhappy with the plan. I, I think the real regret is that you have to then wait 10 days for the budget. You know, the budget is part two of this plan. And it's really important that if we're going to keep those sectors closed, for reasons I completely understand. And I mean, I, do you think it's right to keep them closed as, as long as the government is suggesting? Well, I, I think the Prime Minister is probably the one person in the country who has to weigh up medical advice, school requirements, different sectors of the economy. I think it's only right if financial support comes along. And by the way, James will know this, but I think only 40% of pubs have got outdoor space. I spoke to a pub landlord in Cornwall today. He said, there's no way I could afford to open my pub. So the outdoor space coming early is almost an irrelevance. So look, most businesses think that it's wise that we go slow enough so that we can avoid the stop start. But if you're in hospitality or you're in the aviation sector or you're in the live event sector, it's not good news. So the budget has to tackle that. Let's hear from our audience because I can see lots of hands up. James, you've got yours. I'll come back to you in a minute. Colette. Thank you, Fiona, and hello, panel. Um, I'd just like to clarify something. I actually do run um, home and beauty salons in the personal care sector, and I have the hospitality sector. We have both been treated incredibly disproportionately. You cannot get a drink in beauty salons or hair salons. We don't serve hot refreshment, refreshments doing, because of our COVID safe policies. Secondly, I think we all share the same frustration in business. We're all chomping at the bit to get back into business, and the reason for that is because there's absolutely inadequate government support. We have been excluded from grants. Many councils are still not putting through grants for businesses. The personal care sector has been excluded from VAT cuts. We've also got the issue where we're excluded from government aid. All James is looking for, and quite rightly, business needs to give employees answers. We need to budget, we need to plan. We are running out of cash and running out of cash fast. And we don't want to hear from the government again of what their financial measures are and how many loans we can get. Um, I think personally, coming on to this as well, we have the worst death rates per capita internationally, yet our financial stimulus package compared to other international countries by GDPR is the third lowest. So quite frankly, I think it's time the government actually said what they would do at the beginning, which was we will do whatever it takes. Well, if, the, if you're listening, whatever it takes, if you want businesses to wait to open, then you need to back business because we cannot save jobs unless you start to actually give us proper funding. Well, certainly when it comes to desperate capital, we are, we are among the worst. Uh, P.S. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think my point would be that, you know, it sends the wrong message out. And I, I really, um, you know, feel very sorry for James and, and others like him because actually... From a, as a lay person that isn't in the in the uh, industry, the message that the government is sending out is that somehow it's less safe because that's why you have to wait longer. Uh, and the problem, therefore, will be that even when you do open, people will perhaps not be as willing to go to restaurants as they used to. Uh, and so you need to actually realise that it's also about confidence and the confidence you instil in the public. And your answer, Grant, was really not very 
not very good, if you don't mind me saying, because actually you didn't actually deal with the question. You just muffled over it and talked about something completely different. Um, we, none of us are saying we should throw caution to the wind. We just don't understand how one situation is unsafe, uh, which seems to be just as safe as another situation, which actually might be more unsafe. Uh, and so people won't follow rules or won't be inclined to follow rules if they don't make sense. So you have to explain that science because it doesn't make sense to me as a doctor and as an academic, an honorary academic from the University of Oxford. So to me, it doesn't make sense. So I imagine to lots of people, it doesn't make sense. You need to be able to explain it. Uh, and you need to therefore also instill confidence in the public that when you do open these sectors, that's the right time to open it and why you are delaying sectors in certain, in certain um, ways. Now, Annalise, Labour is supporting the government as far as the timing of the, of the unlocking is concerned, despite the, the, you know, the, the real cri de coeur we're hearing from James and from Jeremy. As far as you're concerned, it is right to, to delay. Well, we think it's really important that the approach is driven by the data, that we make sure this is the last lockdown that we have, that we don't see an imposition of restrictions afterwards. But I think anybody who says that this is, this is going to be simple and easy, particularly for hospitality, has just got that wrong. And, you know, I really did empathise a lot with what people have said, also for the beauty industry as well. This has been an incredibly difficult time. They've worked really hard to make their facilities as safe as possible. But you wouldn't let them wouldn't... open any earlier? Well, unless the data indicates that that would be safe. But I, I just want to underline a point that was made because it's so important that we saw that change in restrictions being announced, you know, about a week ago now, and yet, yet again, we didn't hear what support was going to be available for those businesses that were affected. It's now the, what, the fifth time that that's happened, that we've had those restrictions and a, a particular timeline given for them, but no indication about whether support's going to be continued. And, you know, Colette rightly drew attention also to all of those gaps that still exist for many, many people, particularly self-employed people who've been left out during this crisis. So, you know, we need to be able to recover from this crisis really strongly. That means businesses like the ones that we've just been hearing from need to be supported so they can keep going and then take extra people on, get our economy firing again, secure that recovery. That's what we need to see. Jim. So I want to say before I start, I grew up in a pub. I know what it's like for your family's income to be week to week dependent on your business. I know what it's like to want to um, get back into the social, social settings that we've all had. But what I think is the message that is coming through from the business owners is this is inconsistent. There's no end in sight. And actually... Well, there is an end in sight. Well, it's June the 21st. I think what James is saying is, though, even if it went on longer, a proper financial package of support that made sense and allowed these people to sustain their business, sustain their employees, is actually fundamentally important. You know, if you got ready to open up and had to throw away perishable goods, that has been happening the, throughout the entire pandemic. So what I want to see, you know, and, and it is inconsistent. So, you know, schools are going back. I don't know what James' home life setup is. You could share a household with a teacher who is going back into non-ventilated settings, um, but, but your business can't open. So clarity, um, funding, support for workers, support for businesses, I think that would make all of this much easier to sustain. And we haven't had those things, and we still don't really have a sight of what that would look like. Um, uh, James. Yeah, um, look, I think Grant's fine in saying what he said. He's not really answering my question. I've got six seats on a curb. I've not got this sprawling Mediterranean terrace. You know, it, it, this is not going to make a bit of difference to my business. I'm sick of waiting one or two days for Rishi Sunak to come and announce the right thing. Yet now I've got to wait a week. That anxiety is unfair. We've announced complex financial packages at the drop of a pin. You know, we shouldn't have to wait for a budget. I'm, I'm, the panel have said things that I agree with. I'm not bothered if it's August. I'll open whenever. But what I want is the correct support between now and when I'm supposed to open. You know, uh, why do my one-off grants have to last me longer than the retail sector? Yet they've opened first both times. OK, someone could chime in and say, I've had a VAT cut. 15% VAT saving on zero turnover. It's zero saving. If Rishi Sunak gave that in good faith, extend it now in good faith. And while I'm at it, where's my job retention bonus? Because I already spent it when he told me he was going to give me it, and I spent it on paying my team. <laughs> Jeremy, you've had your hand up for some time. You wanted to come back in. Yeah, I, I think this point's well made, and the job retention bonus is, is affecting us all. I think it's the cost, the cost not just financially, but on people. I think we've got to put 
hospitality in perspective. I mean, direct hospitality accounts for over 3 million employees in this country, with the third highest employer. What it also means is, is a regional spread of 11% of all employees are in the hospitality business. And what's really significant for a really blighted generation is that 50% are in the age of 18 to 24, and that's where all the redundancies are coming. We've already lost 650,000 people um, from the catering industry in 2020. There's going to be at least another 350,000. The number of people like a powder keg sitting on furlough, it, what we're doing is actually just running the univer <clears throat> universal credit scheme on behalf of the government. And, and Jeremy, cheap, Jeremy, I mean, so I'm sorry to interrupt, but can I, can I just ask it. you, are, are you swayed at all when you hear the scientists talk about the risk of indoor settings and the risk of infections ticking up, as they did slowly, but they did begin to tick up over the summer as indoor venues and, and hospitality began to open? Does that not give you pause? That doesn't... Well, it would pause, but in fact, the government, the government figures showed absolutely the opposite. We've seen uh, point naught. 0.5% uh, infection among customers. The, the government, the ONS, have actually produced the figures themselves. The infection risk is very, very low in these situations. And I don't understand also this idea that being outside, suddenly you're safe. You're less vulnerable, perhaps, but you're not safe. Yeah. I've walked through Soho, where people are sitting cheek by jowl, shouting each other in the, in the noise. This is not safe. The COVID does not respect the fact that you're outside. It's, it, there's a much greater there's a much greater facet to it is actually how close you are to people, and also the practicality of it. I, I do despair that sometimes that the nobody in the government's actually worked in the hospitality industry, and that this is all committee this is all committee decisions. And I, my feeling about committees, I, mean, I love the old saying that a, a camel is a horse designed by a committee. You sort of get there in the end, which is what we're doing, but it could have been a lot better. And I know this is about recriminations and so on, and, and nobody likes recrimination, but the, I think it's Churchillian is that <clears throat> the use of recriminating about the things of the past is that it can help us enforce that things are done better in the future, and this is what we need now. And the budget, as James says, is crucial to us. Grant. We're, look, we're just desperate to open everything up. Of course we are. But, you know, you, talk, you call it uh, decision by committee. The reality is, as, as you suggested, you have to weigh up uh, the, uh, you know, the extent to which people have sacrificed staying inside. We try to open it up. We got the new variant. You know, this is not a straightforward, simple decision from one perspective. And, James, you've said a, a couple of times, I haven't quite answered your question. I just want to give it another go for you. Yes, that's um, a cardinal people, sin on, people, on question time, Grant, yeah. so you better <laughs> give it a go. Let me try and fix it. People sitting on a bench outside, two people, drinking a coffee is, I'm afraid, very, very different. And, James, there's a pile of evidence, uh, Jeremy as well, that actually when you're indoor, uh, that is how it, uh, it spreads much, much more easily. All the scientists say this. When I speak to Chris Whitty, the chief medical officer, it's the first thing they say. Outdoor is much safer than indoor. And once you introduce alcohol into it as well, once you introduce more people into it, unfortunately, and these things all add up. Joe's right, in a sense, actually, that a lot of the time you could say, well, we could do A, B or C, and what's the logic between them? The answer is you have to make a distinction somewhere. And our distinction is we think schools should go back first. And that does use up a bit of the, the budget for the R, for the famous you know, reproduction rate. But we could make a, a different decision. We could say we'll send hospitality back first, but we won't send schools back. I think that'd be the wrong thing to do. That's why we've not gone down that route. And listening to this conversation, I know how frustrating it is. We all want to open up, but we have been providing I think, 280 billion pounds of support so far in the hospitality sector, the VAT cut, which I take James's point, if you're not running, is not uh, the be-all and end-all, to say the least. However, there's also been a scheme that's paying uh, the majority of uh, rates whilst this is going on, the majority of furlough whilst this is going on, so staff aren't uh, being paid. And you talk about you want Rishi Sonic to come out and say, now you've got this roadmap, which is a specific set of data, and if the data comes to plan dates as well, so you know the date, for example, when you'll be able to open uh, outside on the, on the 12th of April. Um, but the support's already in place because the support hasn't ended when the Prime Minister announced the roadmap and you only have to wait till next Wednesday to get the uh, full detail from the budget as well. So, look, 
th there is no magic solution to this. That's what I'm trying to say. We're doing our best, weighing up the different competing issues to do with people's health, not getting back into this again, which won't be any good for James or for Jeremy's restaurants, because we'll be going around this again, uh, and, uh, and doing it the best way we possibly can. But there is no okay. perfect solution, and I'm the first to say that. There's a lot of shaking heads and thumbs down, I'm afraid, you're getting there from, from our audience. Annalise, briefly, before we move on. Yeah, just one very quick question to Grant. Why can't your government announce earlier whether things like the business rates holiday will be continued or the furlough scheme will be continued? It feels like you've left this off until the budget to have that big political event. Now, no one's going to, you know, say yeah, that's a terrible make, thing. But, but the problem but, is that actually for these business yeah, people, they're trying but, to say to their employees whether they can keep them on, right. whether they're going to be in work in the next few months. No, but hold on a minute, Alice. You're, you're being very disingenuous because all the support remains. It's not like any of it ends before next Wednesday at all. And the budget Wednesday, is on Wednesday. But it ends, for example, before some of it. Some of that support ends... There's before nothing that ends, before, there's nothing that ends finish, before next Wednesday. If I may finish, nothing ends before next Wednesday, but if you run a business, if you run a pub or a restaurant, you can't be, you know, speedily changing decisions in a matter of literally days. The support does end, some of it, before indoor hospitality is allowed to open, according to the roadmap. And that is giving people like this an enormous headache. I, I, I've spoken to I have so to many say, of them, Annalise, and I'm you're... sure you have as well, with respect, Grant, and I wish your government would start putting its mindset I, I think, uh, uh, into the uh, uh, position uh, of some of these businesses, uh, rather than being driven by politics, which is what it uh, Annalise, like. I have to say, I think you're the one who's playing politics with this. Uh, <laughs> the idea that we can't wait till next Wednesday to have a full budget, which is part two of this, and actually sets out all the detail behind this roadmap. I mean, it, one, if you ever became Chancellor, are you saying you're not going to have budgets in order to do these things? Of course it's the right way to do it. Tony? Well, look, I think that I completely... Uh believe that it's the Prime Minister and the government's decision to weigh up these factors. It's, it's not for businesses. I think we'd all probably agree that. There's a lot of things at play. I also think the support package from the Chancellor has been generous to date. I think the thing the government is missing, uh, and you can understand why they're managing a very significant crisis, is they don't really understand business decision making, the timescales of it. Mm. You know, we, we miss the fact that hospitality missed its golden quarter in the last quarter of the year. We've probably missed the fact that automotive is mi missing March, which is probably its biggest series. And what we're also missing is the fact that actually, if the Chancellor comes forward with a few months of support, and I hope that he will, and I believe that he will, actually, whether or not we're going to get any demand into our businesses in the next six months, whether or not people are going to come back to pubs, is the business reality. So look, I, I think, uh, let's not get too divided on this one. I think we now have a roadmap. I think it's a reasonable roadmap. I think support has been generous. All I think I would ask, Grant, is that the government tries a bit harder to get inside the business decision-making of firms, because the truth is, before next Wednesday, some firms will take a decision to pack up. And I, I think we could have avoided that. We could have aligned the Chancellor's announcements with the Prime Minister's. So let's just stay I, I, connected on this and let's just okay. get inside the mind of the business person and the way they make decisions. OK, great. I know you want to come in, but, but you've had quite a lot of time to answer. If you forgive me, I'm going to go on and take one more question, which is from Colette. Colette Osborne. Um, good evening. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you, panel. Um, why not a vaccine passport to allow businesses to ensure COVID safety when entering indoor venues? So you run a, a hairdressing uh, salon, don't you, Colette? Is that what you would like? Well, yeah, obviously I run hair and beauty salons and I also represent 11,000 salons across the country. Now, our normal practice is we're very safe, we're very clean, it's part of our training. If the government, obviously, you know, we do need something like this because, you know, we're being told to have a, safe, a COVID safe certificate in our window and follow COVID safe policies. We're spending tens of thousands on all this PP equipment. That's gone up exponentially. Um, so, yes, actually, I think it is absolutely the right thing so we can protect the interests of our employees and our clients. Um, and then at least people know they're going to a COVID safe environment because we're saying it's indoor safer than outdoor. Some indoor environments run on a medical basis. Um, and like James said, and Jeremy, you can have people sitting cheek to cheek on a park bench. Yet, are we saying that hospitals aren't safe because they're indoors? You know, there's all kinds of things here, but absolutely, I think it's the right way to go. Um, it would give the public certainty. It would give them confidence to be able to go back into hospitality, back into restaurants, back into salons, back into other venues and even schools. And more importantly, it would satisfy one of the other issues we have, 
which is that insurers aren't actually covering businesses right now. So, okay. absolutely 100%. I'd love to see it. Thank you. So, you would very much like to see vaccine passports. Uh, Jeremy, is this something you'd like to see in your restaurants, that people have to have certification to say that they've, they've had the vaccine before they come in? I think it's one solution. I mean, one has to say that nobody has to go to a restaurant, nobody has to get on an aeroplane, whatever, but it, in many ways it's a luxury. But I think it's something very important if we're going to, if we're going to break through on the safety rule. I feel that we, we need more than just the practicalities of life. I mean, in hospitality, it's about the conviviality of community, and I think people were prepared to do it. I, I do know and understand the concerns about civil liberties when it comes to COVID <clears throat> vaccines, but one of the things I do like about it is very egalitarian. One of the great successes of the uh, vaccine program is that it doesn't matter who you are, how much money you've got or whatever, you have a right. And it's one of the purest examples. I'd love to see the passports used. I don't want to force anybody to have a vaccine, though. And when it comes to who's having the vaccine, though, Jeremy, I mean, obviously younger people are going to get the vaccine much later on. So you've got uh, the UK Hospitality uh, Association, for example, saying it's not, it's not really workable because young people won't be vaccinated until the autumn, so they won't be able to have a certificate to be able to come into a, a restaurant like yours, for example. Oh, absolutely. The, the, and that is always going to be the shortcomings of it. But at the same time, uh, this is only for a comparatively short period, and it could just be the way through. I'm not advocating as such. I'm not against it. Annelise, what's Labour's position? Do you support uh, them? Well, this isn't a simple issue, and I think that's been summed up, in fact, in just what Jeremy said. I mean, I think there are risks in all different directions, actually, around this. I mean, obviously, there are major practicalities. There are those kind of ethical issues as well and equality issues. I mean, I have to say, personally, to me, the most important thing that's kind of obscured a bit by this debate is about the speed of vaccination itself. Yeah, but hang no, on, but, at least that's not the question. Hesitant. That isn't the question. The well, question is, <laughs> should there be a vaccine, vaccine passport to allow businesses to ensure COVID safety when entering indoor venues? Do you have a position on that? Well, but if we, if with respect, if we don't actually see people being vaccinated at speed, then it will be very unfair because those very young people Do you think that were just mentioned slowly? wouldn't be able to have that vaccine. Well, yes, we have said, for example, that we would have wanted the vaccination to go much more quickly so that we could have, for example, had teachers vaccinated over the half term, we did state that, and we believe there could have been capacity to deliver that. You know, there are examples, okay. in fact, of different facilities that have said they could have been involved in that vaccination. And what's your answer to, to, the, to the question? So the precise question is, I think we've got to be driven by the evidence. I don't think a politician saying black and white, yes, no on this, without having that evidence is credible, to be honest. We so, need to look at this carefully. The government, I'm sure that Grant will talk about this, they've announced a review around this subject. I think that's right. Because I think, you know, if there is, for example, a system in the future that's introduced, it needs to command public support if it is going to come in. It needs to right. be credible. But just to be clear, at the robust. moment you don't have a position as to whether vaccine passports to be able to get into businesses, uh, you know, restaurants, what have you, you don't have a position as to whether that's a good idea or a bad idea. Well, the position is we need to have the evidence around this. We need to understand more. Uh, Joe. So I have two reservations. Um, one, I think as a customer, you might think that it's fine. Um, and that's kind of your choice as a customer. But I, I have two reservations. And one is about workers and the extent to whether or not workers will be compelled, coerced uh, and persuaded in other ways to have a vaccine when they may not want to and what that actually means for you and your employment rights. But my primary concern, and I, I worry that this has happened a lot during the pandemic, is we're always looking for a quick solution, for a shortcut, for the next technical fix, when what we actually really need to do is get on top of the virus and get as close to a zero COVID state as, as possible. And then we wouldn't be looking for the next technologi technological fix. So I have lots and lots of empathy with business owners who would like this as a way to enable their customers to feel safe. But I think there's a huge sting in the tail for workers here who have often been sidelined in many conversations about reopening, particularly in terms of hospitality and getting people back in. OK, Bethany. What would you like to say? Um, so I work in healthcare and I encourage every patient who I meet to get their COVID vaccine. But the idea of a vaccine passport, I think, is ethically completely unacceptable. You cannot have two tiers of society, one group who can go out and enjoy themselves and the other group who have to stay inside. It's, I just think the moral dilemma that that creates is absolutely awful. 
And if it was their choice, not because they were ineligible for a vaccine, but because they chose not to have it, you would still find that ethically un unacceptable? Yeah, you can't coerce people to have any health care treatments that they don't want, whether it's for public good or not, it's coercion. It's unfair. Becky? Yeah, so just to completely agree with that, um, I think it would be immoral to force people to, to be vaccinated when they don't want to be. Um, I also work in healthcare. Um, I've had my vaccine and I would strongly encourage every single person, as soon as you get the letter or as soon as you call, to go and have the vaccine. But I think there's something about understanding the reasons why people aren't having the vaccine and encouraging and supporting and educating as opposed to penalising people. And I also agree that it would just deepen um, in, in inequality where you've got a two-tier system and um, it wouldn't be fair at all. And also just on a, on a practical basis, the viability of it, you know, how, how would it work? Um, I just can't, I, I see that it, it might be open to abuse and exploitation. Um, I just don't think the investment of a system like that is worth what we would get off the back of it. I think it would just, as I say, lead to inequality. Steve. Thanks, Fiona. Um, it already exists in a way. I I'm lucky enough to have had my first vaccination. And when you get back to the vaccination, uh, you get a little card that gives you the details of the date and time of the vaccination. Now, assuming that my situation is not unique, then it probably means that the majority of people have already had such a, a document. Now, business owners can decide at their own whim whether or not to serve people. If they choose to say, if you can't show proof that you've had a vaccination, then they're perfectly legally entitled to do that. So the point is really a, a vaccination passport almost exists already. Tony, what's, what's the view of the CBI on this? Well, I've, uh, I've asked about 200 businesses about this uh, this week, and this is what I've learned. Number one, uh, it can't just be for vaccination, it should also include testing. Right? And, and I think that will take care of some of the timing thing. I agree with Jeremy that it, I don't think it's quite the coercion issue, because I think these are we're talking about voluntary activities. It certainly shouldn't be true for compulsory activities. Uh, for the third thing that I think everyone is saying is, look, this can't be the new normal. We can't build a society where everybody carries around health cards. This is different, I think, to airport security after 9-11, which changed forever. This would be relevant and useful and welcomed if it would help in the short run. The only thing I would say, and Grant, I think this is for Michael Gove in his review, you have to talk to people at the front line who have to make this happen. We saw with supermarkets and pubs and restaurants when it came to masks and compulsory mask wearing, that was incredibly difficult to implement. You know, I spoke, my pub owner today told me that, we're, you know, fights were breaking out everywhere at pubs, right? So I, I do think if we're going to, I realise there are ethical issues, but even before you get to the ethical issues, let's make sure that this is implementable. And I, you know, apropos the last question, let's get talking to people on this call who are working in restaurants and hair salons to talk about how to do it, let's make sure we could do it. And then I think if it helps in the short run, I think it's definitely worth a look. So Grant, we had the vaccines minister saying it was absolutely out of the question, but it's clearly not out of the question now because the government is considering doing exactly this. Yeah, and that was much earlier before we'd really got the vaccination. Well, it was a couple of weeks got, ago. So, well, that's the speed of the vaccination programme. Well, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. That's not ages ago, uh, uh, two or three weeks ago, something let, like that. Nadine Zahai was saying, Absolutely let, let's, not. Let's talk about the future. So, so, you know, we've got a third of over the third of the population vaccinated now. It is a real question. The, the points that have been uh, raised, I think, have been very good. Actually, when you start to open it up, it's a can of worms. It's there are moral, ethical uh, issues. There are practicalities, uh, which is why we've set up this um, uh, task force to to look at it because we suspect that if government's not involved and not having the discussion, uh, businesses would try and go off and do their own things. What happens to somebody who? for medical reasons, can't have it, to younger people who won't get this for a while, although we hope to have all adults done by July, to children, for the vaccine's not even been trialled on children yet, so we're saying they can't you know, access those services. Uh, it's absolutely true to say that this needs to be uh, about um, testing as well as vaccines. And then, of course, how does it work for international travel? And I'm running a, a separate task force on international global travel task force to work out what we do there. When we travel internationally, we, we, to certain countries, you have to show a yellow fever card. Um, so there are already precedents for this sort of thing, so we're working internationally on it as well. But it, it is a minefield, and um, I, I think actually all the points have been very, very well made. What we're going to do is have a look at this and then come forward with some recommendations about how it can practically work. 
The one thing I would say is the more people, and I agree with everyone who said it, the more people we can get vaccinated, um, the better. And it is, I, I, you know, I thought actually the one thing we'd all agree on this evening is the speed of the vaccination program has been tremendous. There's no country in Europe who are anywhere close to the speed we've got. Well, Annalise doesn't one, think you're getting one close of the, Well, I'm surprised to hear that. One of the, one of the amazing, um, uh, uh, one of the things we're going to have to think about actually, talking about international travel, is... Uh, what happens if we are largely vaccinated by the summer, for example, but the places people want to go to aren't vaccinated? Another can of worms. So there are all sorts of questions, which is why we've set up two task force, one that Michael Gove will run on sort of the domestic okay. side and one international that I'll run. Let's take another question from Vanessa. Vanessa Appiah. Good evening. Um, so Matt Hancock claimed that there never was a national PPE shortage during the pandemic. Frankly, I find this quite disrespectful to all the healthcare workers that have been fighting for their safety during the pandemic. So can the government explain why they think there were no shortages? Well, I'll let you catch your breath, Grant, because you've just finished speaking. Annalise, do you want to start us off on this? Well, I think it's been very difficult for the government to explain why there were no shortages, because we know that there were shortages. And I know that myself from having talked to health professionals, people who were deeply frustrated, who were actually in some cases quite frightened, to be honest with you, about the working situation. They were at that front line. And I think it's deeply disappointing that we don't have that openness about what went wrong. Somebody mentioned earlier, I can't remember who it was, but somebody said it was really important. Yeah, it was Jeremy who said that actually we, we need to learn from what happened during this crisis. We need to understand you know, when, when there were those problems with supply, how we can make sure that we don't end up in that position again. I think that's critically important. Let's be honest about this. Let's learn from those at the front line so that we can ensure they have what they need into the future. So, Grant, this is the first time I've seen you reach for your notes. I'm just wondering if this is a tricky yeah. question for no, you. No, it, it wasn't for that reason, actually. I just wanted to actually quote something which, I, which I'd read, which was from NHS providers who said we were always able to get what we needed uh, in time. But... The well, National actually, Audit Office but, also but, but said that that was not the report but, from frontline staff. But, but let me follow up on that by saying, I think, you know, if you think about the way this virus got going and the entire world was looking to get PPE, and by the way... we no, hang on, we, we all know it was difficult yeah. and there was a global shortage. You yeah. don't need to tell us that. The question is, Matt Hancock claimed there was never a national PPE shortage during the pandemic. Do you think he was right? I think, I think what he was saying was quoting from NHS providers. What I'm saying also... Was he is right? That, That's the question. Well, was well, yes, he right? Yes, because the NHS providers said they were always able to get it. But it So when you had doctors say, wearing bin me, liners me point, and though, ski though. goggles, uh, you've got the, RC, the head of the Royal College of Nursing saying this is deeply insulting. Nursing staff were put in harm's way because they couldn't access proper protective equipment. That's what she's reporting. We'll find this insulting. You've got the Docs Association supplying 45,000 master hospitals because they didn't have enough. He, are you, are yeah. you saying he's right, that there was no national shortage of PPE? I, let me try and answer the question, and I'll, I'll try and get the whole thing out, which is that, first of all, the entire world was scrambling to get PPE. No, no, we know that. We, we okay, all know but that. Let me finish the, the point. We didn't have a domestic manufacturing base for PPE in this country of any size. Now, uh, we're producing 70% of the PPE that we require uh, right here. We've delivered 32 billion pieces of PPE. The question is, was it, you know, were we having to work very hard on no, the day-by-day No, no, the question is, to, was to Matt get... Hancock yes. right that there, was, there never was a national PPE shortage? We always, That's the question. We, we always, with the exception of some isolated cases, managed to get the, the PPE there. But I'm trying to answer this as honestly as possible for you. It wasn't a satisfactory situation that we didn't have domestic production, that everybody was trying to get the same PPE. What we were prepared for was a flu pandemic, very different types of PPE. So, of course, only a fool would say you wouldn't look back on this and say there are things that we wish we had had, um, pieces of equipment we had. And, and uh, you know, if it was starting again from today, of course, we'd now have it not least because but we're so, but manufacturing just, here. But just to be clear, then, so you think he was right to say that there... I th that there wasn't a national... Well, I think he was either issue. quoting from NHS providers who said they were always able, in the end, to get what they needed, or from Meg Hillier, the Labour chair of the Public Accounts Committee, who said that the bench, uh, this was a benchmark for procurement exercise in getting this PPE. 32 billion pieces of PPE. Remember the government... OK, OK, so you're saying, he's, you're saying he's right. But I just want to be clear the, about Remember that. this. The government's previously never, ever been responsible for supplying PPE... Okay. To hold on, it's a very important point. <laughs> okay. To the care sector, I'm definitely the care trying sector to get you to answer the question. Themselves. The government actually managed to complete the purchase so that the care sector was receiving it as well, in addition to all the hospitals. Joe, 
I don't understand why we're making up excuses for Matt Hancock's either gross act of amnesia or a willful misremembering of what happened last year. I mean, I was on numerous calls via the TUC with government. There was insufficient PPE in hospitals. There was frequently the adoption of a two-tier system of who got PPE because there was so little of it. There were surgeons, nurses, care workers reusing PPE. There were some examples of hospitals being delivered PPE that was 10 years out of date. That's before we even get towards the care sector. Um, you know, some of the lowest paid, insecurely paid people, literally the ones holding iPads while we had to watch our loved ones in care homes on Zoom not having access to PPE. The idea we're all took by surprise couldn't possibly accommodate this when that is decades, years and decades of underfunding of our NHS is an insult to anybody who provides any care, who works in that sector or associated um, industries. And it would be so much nicer if we could just apologise to those people, acknowledge what happened and not give contracts to our mates who don't even have any experience in providing PPE. That would be a great start. OK. I mean, obviously, the government denies that that, that, is, that is, in fact, what's happened in terms of handing out contracts. Yeah. Now, there's a few medics in our audience, so I just want to hear from you. And you've got your hands up. So, P.S., I could see you smiling throughout that. I don't know if you were agreeing or disagreeing. Yeah, no, so I'm sympathetic to Grant's um, reasoning as to why it was difficult to get enough PPE. But again, that doesn't answer the question. The question was, was there a shortage? There was a shortage. And your entire answer was explaining why it was difficult to get it and why there was a shortage. But you have to acknowledge that there was a shortage. Yes, it was difficult to get it, but I know colleagues personally who were in unprotected situations that got COVID. I have family, friend, colleagues who are medics who have died from COVID having not had PPE. So for you to stay there, to sit there and say there was no shortage is grossly insulting. I would much rather you said, this is really hard. It's really hard for us to have got the PPE. And yes, therefore, we weren't able to get it all. And there was a shortage. We can then understand that, rather than you denying the fact that there was a shortage. Bethany? Hi. Um, I think that we should be ashamed to have Matt Hancock as a health secretary. I think he's been repeatedly disrespectful towards everyone in the health and care sector. Colleagues have died and been unwell because of shortages. Whether people tried to access PP or, or not is not the point. But the fact there was a shortage and he has ignored that and been disrespectful to a whole sector that he is in charge of is disgraceful. Uh, and Becky, you work in the NHS as well. Yeah, so I, I think this just speaks to a broader point of not being able to acknowledge when mistakes have been made. Yeah. And I think the thing that Matt Hancock could really learn from help the health and care sector is... Um, we have uh, systems of learning and, and safety cultures embedded that we're constantly trying to, um, to, to improve. And we really need to acknowledge when mistakes have been made in order to learn from them. Um, we are all fallible. We are human beings. We will always make mistakes. It was really difficult. It was difficult for every single country. But by not acknowledging that, I understand it's politically difficult to say, I've made a mistake, I should try harder, we need to do things differently. But unfortunately, we're going to have to start doing that because that's the only way that we will get better as a country. Jeremy. It's, it's really interesting that we've had uh, a proliferation around the world of what I'd call narcissistic denial, that if we shout loud enough that something didn't happen, we expect people to imagine it didn't. And I feel... The old saying that success has many parents and failure is an orphan is very prevalent at the moment. And I think before we move away from vaccinations, one of the great successes who everybody is taking the, uh, taking the uh, credit for is Kate Bingham. She didn't have any vaccines available, just like there was no PPE, but with amazing, amazing resilience. She managed to make one of the great successes of this awful pandemic is the rollout of the vaccination program and doesn't get the credit for it. I do long for a time when people will admit their mistakes. We are all human. Um, I'm just very disappointed that there was a denial. Tony. Uh, well, I'm going to be a very boring business person on this one. I, I think this might be a bit more boring in that I think what there was... Well, we don't, don't, please don't be boring. Oh, no, well, I'll, well, I'll, <laughs> well now I've created the right expectations. <laughs> I, look, I, I think what there wasn't was an oversupply of PPE, which is what you need if everybody's going to be able to access it. So what, you don't think there's a shortage? 
Well, I think that I can... No, well, I think there was a shortage by definition because there wasn't enough in the place it needed to be all the time. I mean, this is like stocking supermarkets around the country, right? It's not like somebody centrally says the country's going to need a million loaves of bread and therefore we'll have a million loaves of bread and we'll spread them. The country needs two million loaves of bread if there's going to be a million bought so that every local shop's got enough loaves of bread. And I suspect what's going on here, if I might say, I'm sorry, it's a much more boring answer, is that people are sitting centrally going, well, actually, we've got enough stock for what the country needs, but that doesn't mean that every local hospital has got enough supply, and some will have a bit more, and some won't have enough, and some haven't got access. And to Jeremy's point about the vaccine, what we've got now, which puts us in such great shape, is we have an oversupply of vaccine. In fact, we've got people at the end of the day who are trying to get rid of vaccine with volunteers and so on. What we didn't have with PPE, it occurs to me, is the necessary oversupply of PPE. So I think it's a bit disingenuous to sit sort of centrally and say, well, mathematically, we've got enough. If you haven't got enough in every part of the country, then you haven't got enough. And I think this might just be a math story rather than anything too much more sinister than that. So, Grant, listen, you, uh, I must let you reply. Narcissistic denial which is a new one on, on Question Time. I'm interested in that. Narcissistic denial, disingenuous, insulting, just not true. I, th I think those were to Matt, but nonetheless, I'll still take it on <laughs> for his behalf. No, no, well, you're here um, for the government, I'm afraid, fine. so, you, so you've fine. copped it. Look, look I, the, the trouble is the conversation like this. We're starting from a position now where we've delivered 32 billion pieces of PPE. We've got all these vaccines. We're at the other end of this crisis. A year ago, if we'd been sitting here, and we were all just starting to hear about this coronavirus thing, the truth is, blame it on us, blame it on other governments. For years, this country had not invested in uh, doing testing, so we couldn't test for this. We hadn't invested in uh, creating, making PPE, so that 1% of our PPE was being made in this country. And so I don't, want to, I don't want to sit here and say, oh, it was all easy and we thought there was plenty here and what have you. We didn't. Day in, day out. We were battling to make sure that there was enough PPE in the uh, hospitals and in the care homes, so we'd never had to... Uh, supply before and we were in that battle worldwide globally with every other country now the panelists and the audience and people listening are right to say why didn't britain work this all out before the pandemic i i, I well they, we they had, were actually just saying that there was a two. shortage that's I what they we were saying had two. but um i think as i say what i i, I vaguely picked up on um the, the health sex comments and i think he was quoting nhs providers rather than himself in saying that and okay. probably right. probably the point is about getting it to the right place help that was given to us by the army to get it there it was a national okay. effort to get there and at the other end of this crisis we can see that now people don't complain my father's just been in hospital we've had those conversations okay. on the ipads yeah. and what have you right. I'm, I'm not i'm not none of the in the greatest respect right, now, i'm not entirely sure that your uh, answer question put by the audience here, so let's move because on. none of the doctors are saying now they don't have the ppe in fact when i spoke to the doctors they were saying they've got the best ppe now but right. they were in the summer okay right, the okay we i've given it my best shot at getting you to answer this grant i'm not entirely sure if I've, I've succeeded but let's take another question now from stephanie stephanie pitts hi um why do the government think that summer schools are a good way for students to catch up, especially disadvantaged students? So, Stephanie, you are a business manager at a secondary school. This is also right. is a new, announce, new announcement about the summer schools. Mm -hmm. Do you think it would be a good idea? I, th I think the problem with it is that um, certainly for disadvantaged students, they're not going to take up the opportunity. Um, the EEF did a pilot, and I think about 50% um, didn't take up the opportunity. Um, I think there are other ways, and I think school leaders know their cohorts um, and their communities, and I think they're best placed to decide how to do the catch-up. So you think just leave um, it up to the schools? OK, Joe. Pardon? You think just leave it up to the schools? Yeah, I think they should make okay. the decisions. They know their communities, they know their students. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to just endorse the final point that actually listening to the professionals that deliver education and what is best um, is crucial to anything that happens going forward. I think with the regards to the exact question, um, I think catch up is a bit of um, a distraction, particularly for schools, particularly colleges and universities. Learning never stops. Work never stops. We don't close in the summer. There's all sorts of prep. That, so the idea that people stop working and therefore can invest time in catch up isn't of itself problematic. Um, 
I think to address the particular question, if there's going to be funding made available, and this will cost money, um, disadvantaged children taking part in play, in sports, um, funding for meal clubs, you know, all of the things that families, teachers, children have been specifically asking for, I think is what will be crucial in the summer, not some idea of catch up um, to pass SATs or to pass exams and, and actually channeling money where it is needed and engaging teachers and those professionals in those conversations and not dictating to them yet more demands on their time. And I think just to use the university and college setting, you know, the expansion of blended learning, which is online and in person, has already meant that people are at burnout. The idea that people have a second shift or a third or fourth shift to give throughout the summer when they are exhausted is just not going to happen. And if the government does want catch up teaching prioritised in any sector, they need to be really clear about what schools, colleges and universities have to deprioritise. Because work doesn't stop, places don't close. So actually they're just asking people to do more if they don't deprioritise and initially fund. So Tony, you've got a couple of boys at school. Yeah. Would they welcome the idea of summer school? I'm sure they'd hate the idea of summer school, but that, <laughs> okay. doesn't, that doesn't mean I'm ruling it out. No, I think, look, I've got one son doing A-levels and one now picking his GCSEs. I think we're all going to be doing catch-up in various stages of education and learning in the next few years, if I'm honest. I think that, you know, speaking to some university vice-chancellors, I'm sure, Joe, you'll accept this, that we're going to have people arriving in universities who haven't had the right education, and we're going to have to have universities in the first term of next year trying to help them catch up. We're going to have people leaving, you know, supposedly leaving college qualifications, not fully trained to go into the workplace. We're going to have graduates leaving, going into the workplace, not quite ready. I think we're all going to be in the catch up industry. Uh, and I think, yes, of course, people who've had a, a far worse experience, we should be prioritizing them. But I think it's going to be true across all stages of education. And it's going to be one of the effects of the last two years. Now, Beatrice, you're the one in our audience who is at school. You're in the sixth form. Uh, what do you think? Um, I think that it's so crucial that children are actually given a break this summer. Um, it has, there has been so much pressure on um, young people during this pandemic. And then to take this break away from them, I think, would just be devastating. I've seen, you know, awful effects on mental health from my family who are at school, mm. my friends. It's been so difficult. And, and I think it's all well and good, um, Joe, saying that teachers need a break. These are young, developing minds. It's a million times worse for them. So if we're talking about the implications for adults and their mental health, think about the children. Um, I also think it's really important, um, going on from what Steph said, that these things are done individually, I have not had a conventional school experience. Most people have had different issues that have shaped them. And I think that trying to roll out the same thing for everyone just doesn't work, especially when it's young people, because everyone leads such different lives and everyone learns so differently. Mm. I don't uh, think there's a one fits all. More, not a one size fits all. Sam, I've got to ask you, because you've got no. five... Sam, you've got five kids. So are you desperate to get them to summer school? <laughs> No. Okay. <laughs> no, okay. no. Uh, summer is summer. It's our summer. And no, I mean, they have been put under enough pressure with all the home learning. Parents have been put under a lot of pressure. And the teachers as well. I think we all just deserve that six weeks of fun time. You know, my two eldest boys, who are U11 and U13, have been stuck in that bedroom six hours a day, five days a week. You know, putting them into extra lessons is just, no, I just don't think it's fair. And the same with my two youngest, you know, I don't mind if it's an after school thing, you know, a couple of times a week, maybe during a term time, but not okay. during the summer. I just think it's so unfair. No. <laughs> So it's not, not a total thumbs up we're getting that, here. I mean, I'm sure there are some people who support it, of course, but, but it's I, interesting I, what we're hearing. I polled it with my own um, twins who are both um, doing their A-levels uh, this evening before coming out. And uh, I have to say, they weren't enamoured uh, at the idea. But having said that, they are also desperate to get back to uh, you know, more structured learning. And I think the question's come up um, today because and the Education Secretary announced £700 million, yeah. of which I think £200 million is about how we can do catch-up, perhaps 
uh, in certain years, key, at key moments, um, some of which could be during the summer. There are also other parts to that, tutoring programmes, mentoring programmes and other things. And it's part of a £1.7 billion package to try and get the children, actually exactly, you know, children's age at school who have lost out probably more than any other single group during this crisis. Because for other groups, although it's been horrendous and it has been, for children, it's such a formative time. I mean, I really recognise what Beatrice was saying. Okay. It's exactly how my, my kids feel about it. Jeremy? I feel very strongly that what the children need is occupation, stimulation, caring, loving, to find a way through uh, to escape what a year they've had. And if summer school is purely about catching up in order to pass exams, I'm heartily opposed to it because some of the most brilliant people I've known have failed their exams terribly. It's not about passing exams. It's time we should move, we should move away from the system of doing it. It's, is much more to it. Uh, Annalise, summer schools, which obviously was, was raised by Steph there, is this something you support? Or not. Well, certainly we do feel there needs to be a lot of support for children to catch up. I mean, on average, they've lost, what, over 100 days in school, many of them. And actually, the summer school programme, as I understand it, it's only going to be covering, what, about one in three children who actually receive free school meals. This is a very small scheme for those who even might be keen on attending in the first place. I just think the government has got this one wrong. I don't think they're facing up to the scale of the challenge. People might have seen the Institute for Fiscal Studies released a report that indicated the long-term impact of this period on children. The fact that, you know, for many of them, if it does have that educational impact, that will carry right through into adulthood. That will carry right through into, you know, what they might earn over their lifetime. Of course, that's not the only thing we look for from education, but it is going to be really significant for them. So I have to say, looking at this from an economic point of view, I am concerned about that impact on our children. I don't feel that the government has sufficient ambition for those children, given what they've been through. I think so far this alleged catch-up plan, I mean, it really isn't a plan. It's not a long-term plan to be bringing those children and young people up to the stage where they need to be. And, you know, Joe's right. We can't just squeeze more out of the existing system we need to actually provide the resource and it will be worth it in the longer term because not doing that will mean that whole cohort of children and young people who will have been left behind to an extent. Will? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, yeah, three or four weeks summer holiday uh, schooling, is, it's a drop in the ocean. It's not going to do anything. You know, it's got to be a much longer term thing here. And, and you know, to back up what my fellow audience members have said, you know, this summer surely is all about, you know, the kids getting out, enjoying themselves, uh, being with their friends, hugging their grandparents, uh, going to the pubs and restaurants, getting their haircuts, right? <laughs> they need that break as much as everyone else. Yeah, listen, we all want to get our haircut. I can say, <laughs> well, I'm, I hesitate to speak for all of you. I think that's a rather unfair. I speak for myself. Uh, Jim? Uh, I just think it's a bit disingenuous of uh, Annalise to say that children have lost 100 days. Um, it's disingenuous to the children who've been working really hard remotely, those people, those children that have been able to, and there's quite a few of them. It's disingenuous to the, to the teachers who've been actually trying to make it actually happen for them. And it's disingenuous to the parents who've been helping them do it as well. I mean, my, my, I've got two children. When you say to them, oh, you've lost all your school time, they get a bit upset about it because they've been working really hard. And I think it's this thing about, you know, them having lost all this education what they've lost is time with other children. They've lost that time to be children with other children. And if there's anything that's going to happen over the summer, then it should be allowing children to be with other children and learn about being with other children, having fun. Well, having fun, I think we'd all like to have a bit of that, actually. Annelies, I know you want to come back in. I'm afraid we're, we're out of time. Our hour is up. Uh, thank you very much to, to the panel for coming here this evening. Jeremy, thank you very much for joining us down the line. And, of course, to our audience, thank you very much for being part of the programme. And to you at home, thank you very much for watching. From Question Time, bye-bye. Trapped in her bed at home, a mum just wants to feel like a mum again. It's DIY SOS to the rescue. That's next, here on BBC One.
life is color.